Good evening. My name is Chase Robinson, and I'm president of the Graduate Center. And it is a privilege to join you today at the final event of today's conference, The Many Faces of Liberalism. This concludes what I gather to have been an exceptional day of discussion that captured the complex facets of liberalism from universal norms to individual values. Welcome to those of you who've been with us all day long, as well as to those who are just joining us now. Let me begin with some important thank yous. A thank you to Professor Helena Rosenblatt of the Graduate Center, Department of History, whose recent book, The Lost History of Liberalism from Ancient Rome to the 21st Century, has received glowing reviews, and who, along with James Miller from the New School, is the guiding spirit, organizer, engineer, not only of today's panels, but of the conference itself. I hope that you will, at least some of you, be able to attend part two of the conference, which will take place at the New School in February. I should also say that today's conference is part of the Graduate Center's new initiative, a two-year initiative entitled The Promise and Perils of Democracy. I'd also like to thank Professor Don Robotham, the director of the Advanced Research Collaborative, who introduced today's discussions. The Advanced Research Collaborative provided crucial sponsorship for today's conference. Finally, I'd like to thank an extraordinary and interdisciplinary group of scholars and writers for coming to the Graduate Center today to share their collective wisdom on this enormously important topic. I should add, for those of you who weren't able to attend today's sessions, don't despair. Videos will be made available on the conference website. What a moment, what indeed an historical moment for a discussion about liberalism. It's a subject that demands our focus at a time when individual rights and democratic norms appear to be threatened. John Dewey's description of the two streams of liberalism, laissez-faire and interventionist, is the point of departure for tonight's panel. It was Dewey's belief that philosophy had purpose in the public sphere. In his words, philosophy be, could, could be, quote, a method for dealing with the problems of men. That resonates especially here at 365 Fifth Avenue, where the Graduate Center, as many of you will know, is committed to scholarly conferences on timely subjects such as tonight's. This is where public programming illuminates how we must value open debate, rigorous research, and thoughtful and meaningful exploration of pressing challenges. I am very pleased to introduce tonight's panel. Heather Boucher is an economist whose research and writing focus on economic inequality and public policy. She's the executive director and chief economist of the Washington Center for Equitable Growth. You've probably read her work in the New York Times and the Atlantic. You've probably seen her on PBS as well as MSNBC, where she is a frequent contributor. Her latest book is Time Out, The Economics of Work-Life Conflict. Richard Epstein is the Lawrence A. Tisch Professor of Law at NYU, where he directs the Classical Liberal Institute. He's also Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institute and Professor Emeritus and Senior Lecturer at the University of Chicago. He's written extensively about liberalism, liberty, and libertarianism, including articles in major newspapers and a continuing column called The Libertarian for the Hoover Institute. His most recent book is The, Classic, the Classical Liberal Constitution, The Uncertain Quest for Limited Government. 
Paul Krugman is Distinguished Professor of Economics here at the Graduate Center, a core faculty member of our Stone Center on Socioeconomic Inequality, a columnist for the New York Times, and the recipient of the Nobel Prize for Economics. With 4.5 million Twitter followers, I think one of which features a video of him riding a roller coaster with Stephen Colbert. <laughs> he can safely be described as uh, an economics celebrity. Moderating tonight's panel is my good friend, Ruggles Professor of Political Science and History at Columbia, Ira Katznelson. Professor Katznelson's many notable books focus on political theory, comparative politics, and social history. His book, Fear Itself, The New Deal and the Origins of Our Time, was lauded as one of the most trenchant accounts yet of American liberalism, and that from Sean Wilentz. It was awarded both the Bancroft Prize in History and the Woodrow Wilson Foundation Award in Political Science. Please join me in welcoming this distinguished panel. Chase, thank you so very, very much. Um, we're gathered to consider um, the question of uh, what is, we're asked to consider the question, what is the proper relationship between liberalism and free markets? We're almost at the 75th anniversary of uh, two great books published in 1944 that, at least certainly at first blush, took radically different positions um, on this question. We have Friedrich Hayek's Road to Serfdom and Karl Polanyi's Great Transformation. Here's Hayek, and I quote one of the most famous sentences from the book. We have progressively abandoned the freedom in economic affairs without which personal and political freedom has never existed in the past. Socialism means slavery. And Polanyi, as you all know, um, took the position that the liberation of markets, the creation of free markets after the failures of the poor law policy known as Spinomland, um, had created a circumstance in which the marketization of capital, land, and labor had led to, and in his view necessarily led to, a democratic pushback by society seeking to defend itself against market rationality. We might observe, however, that the two positions were not quite as stark as um, the prose of the two authors themselves uh, presented those positions. Uh, Hayek, we might, want to remember, um, who certainly advocated what we generally mean by a laissez-faire economy, nonetheless was in favor of a minimum income for everyone and recognized the necessity to combat general fluctuations in the economy as well as recurrent waves of large-scale unemployment. And he often stated that the preservation of competition was not wholly incompatible with um, large-scale social welfare services. He was deeply opposed, as you know, to planning, um, which he associated with forms of collectivism that would threaten freedom. Polanyi, who was associated by many of us with a social democratic impulse in which, in his language, society protected itself against the market, um, nonetheless was deeply critical of initiatives under the heading of welfare state that he believed had, as in the 1920s in his view, or going back to Spinomland, had disrupted market rationality without providing social security and justice in a way that um, worked um, to create legitimacy for liberal democracy. And his story about why uh, fascism and communism had emerged as the 
dominant alternatives to liberal democracy was in part grounded in his worry that unless we got the balance between market and liberal democracy right, um, cruel and terrible things might follow. Well, enough uh, about this background. We're now going to turn to uh, the three distinguished colleagues, three distinguished economists um, who've already been introduced, who will, under the rules of the game, give us roughly five minutes of opening remarks. Um, then they'll have an opportunity to have a colloquy with each other. Um, and perhaps I'll exercise self-control and perhaps not by jumping in. Um, and then later, we'll, um, this uh, wonderfully large audience will have an opportunity, and I'll say when, um, to put down some questions which um, may then come up and inform the closing um, part of the conversation. So we now turn to such issues as what property rules, what degree of market freedom, how much regulation, what dimensions of inequality are consistent with political regimes that um, we broadly approve of and that we call liberal democracy. What is the repertoire of possibilities? How might we ground the positions we hold? And we begin with Richard Epstein. I'm going first. No, no, no with, with Heather. Begin with me. Uh, what a moderator I am. <laughs> <laughs> Heather. I'd be happy to let Richard go first, but I think, he, I, think I, I will take the helm. Um, thank you for that, and thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, it's exciting to see so many folks here to uh, engage in this really important conversation. I work in Washington, D.C. at the intersection of research and economic policy, and these, the discussion over the course of today and this, these questions tonight could not be more central to the biggest questions, I think, facing our country. I would argue that we are in, like in the, um, as uh, Polanyi named his book, The Great Transformation, um, we are right now in a moment of transformation, both in our economy, in how we think about how well our economy is functioning, and in the kinds of solutions that people are looking to in terms of answers. So it's actually an especially exciting time because it feels that on both the academic side and on the policy side, there's been a sea change over the past few years and a lot more openness to new ideas. So, um, so now is the moment to be thinking about them. I would argue that um, one of the most pressing challenges is the sustained and um, uh, continuing high levels of inequality, both in terms of wealth and in terms of incomes. And that this is itself threatening um, many of the tenets that we hold very dear in terms of what liberalism is. And um, there is a, a really important tension here between how well the market is working and how well government is working or isn't working that are both um, exacerbating these inequalities and doing too little to address them. So of course, I think there's a lot of everyday examples, things that we can all point to, um, that um, ways that our democracy has been granting increased power to economic elites, that is increasing their voices relative to non-elites. Um, both collectively and individually. Things like the fact that there are now no limits on campaign finance, so rich people can give as much as they want and the rest of us who aren't rich don't have that power. Um, we know that there have been succeeding rounds of tax cuts um, at the top of the income distribution, lowering marginal tax rates over my lifetime from a high of 70% down to um, uh, around 37% today. And of course, things like the Janus decision that means that public sector unions can no longer request dues from people that don't want to pay them, um, really sort of hamstringing the ability of unions to have that collective voice for workers. Now, I run a research center that is dedicated to understanding whether and how inequality affects the economy and our society. And while these are some everyday examples of things that we all know about and read in the newspaper, there's also a growing um, body of serious, incredible empirical research that shows the ways that inequality is subverting the institutions of our market and our democracy in ways that are both affecting our society, but are also in turn reverberating throughout our economy. Um, 
you know, the uh, one of the key ways, of course, is that high inequality means that um, people with more economic power have more political power. And you can see this not just in the kinds of examples I've just given, but in research studies that go through and actually demonstrate that um, rich people have, um, if, if rich people are in support of a particular policy, that is two and a half times more likely to be passed into law than if they don't support it, although majorities of, of non-elites might support that. And then, of course, there's issues around agenda setting um, and what gets on to the political agenda um, that is now so much determined by elites without as much um, uh, input from non-elites. And all of this is often justified, not the, not the political outcomes, but the idea that, that inequality is okay for our economy and our society is often justified on the fact that this is because it's the market outcome. And because the market is presumed to be fair and just, um, we shouldn't be intervening. And yet we can see that the ways that this inequality is working its way through means that it's not just that those people who are benefiting in the moment, right, from a particular policy or from a particular market, market outcome that is giving them more gains than others, it's also allowing them to then reset the rules for the next iteration so that um, the rules for the next playing of, of the economy or these outcomes are then rigged towards those at the top, obstructing access for other people to move up and um, limiting uh, uh, the, cho the, 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 uh, the voice of those who are non-elites. I want to make one second comment, if I have a moment here, which is that in the teeing up of these questions that were in the agenda and um, what we're talking about today, I was really struck that it is um, that we're talking about this binary framework between the market and state, which is a very important, two incredibly important sets of institutions. But of course, that leaves out a very important set of institutions, the family, um, which is both outside the market, but also mediates um, what's happening in the economy. And of course, it's something that a lot of people have been talking about for quite a long time, um, but that we know that uh, if we're, if we're going to think about the intersection of market and state, the place where most people do most of their consuming, we consume as families, we reproduce humans as families, we engage with the labor market, with the economy, with the state, in many cases from our position as family members, is something that I hope we can um, uh, add to our discussion today. Because the family poses as a unit poses challenges for the way that we often think about economics, which is often focused on the individual as a unit of analysis, but also poses challenges to the way that we often think about liberalism and democracy, the you know, sort of one person, one vote, or thinking about individual rights, which are often constrained by whether or not people have care responsibilities. So it's an important um, I mean, area that we need to add to our conversation. Thank you very much. Paul? Okay, so I am not especially versed in this intellectual history. Um, and uh, in fact, I've never read Polanyi. But um, um, let me not talk about Hayek and Polanyi. Let me talk about Ronald Reagan. Um, now, I don't know how many people, uh, early Ronald Reagan, not, that, not Reagan as president, but long before that. I don't know how many people have heard of Operation Coffee Cup. Um, but in 1961, uh, the American Medical Association, which was concerned about uh, what was clearly a move towards what would eventually become Medicare, uh, tried to head that off, believing that it would hurt doctors. Didn't turn out that way, but that's what they thought anyway. And so they organized um, uh, Operation Coffee Cup, which was the doctor's wives, it's 1961, doctor's wives were supposed to invite their friends over for coffee where they would listen to a recording of Ronald Reagan explaining how terrible it would be if Medicare was enacted. And what's interesting about that, you can listen to it, it's on YouTube, probably some other places as well, um, is that Reagan did not say, this will be a crushing expense, this will lead to higher taxation, it will destroy incentives, any of those things. He said, this will destroy freedom. Uh, and it ends with this peroration about uh, if this happens, our children will try to explain to their children what it was like to live in a free society. Um, now, uh, Couple of things. First, so it's it's basically comic book Hayek, but then you know most policy, most political philosophy actually influences uh, the real world through comic book versions thereof, um, and um, it it makes the point that 
much of what we call liberalism in America is really is social democracy. It is about having a strong welfare state, about having some government regulation of markets. And um, um, whether it matters that there's another definition of liberalism which doesn't correspond, I don't know. I think it matters if you're trying to understand the historical basis, but um, it's, it, in, in terms of the actual debates that we have, it's almost always uh, how much social democracy should we have. Um, and it makes the point, I think, that um, this is a, it's an empirical question. It's not, a, it's not in the end, mo most of what we're talking about is not a question of, of fundamental values. I mean, if your fundamental value is that personal freedom must include freedom of contract, must include the right to write insurance policies for healthy people and deny them to people with, uh, with pre-existing medical conditions, well, then that's your view. But that's, that's, just a, that's assuming the answer, essentially, here. Uh, social democracy is clearly going to be uh, going to place, uh, is going to do some damage to that notion of freedom, but that's not what people, certainly not what Reagan expected people to take from his recording. What he wanted people to believe is that other aspects of personal freedom, freedom of expression, freedom of thought, freedom to, uh, to lead a, a life, uh, you know, lifestyle that was unconventional, whatever, all, all the ways in which individuals um, feel that they don't have to uh, obey their political masters or, or uh, or conform to outside norms would be endangered by an expansion of the welfare state, um, and that's a you know that's a you can under there, there's a case there's an argument Hayek made it about how that might happen, but we've run that experiment. In fact, we've run it repeatedly. Uh, as far as I've noticed, Medicare did not destroy uh, a free society in America. Um, we have not only do we have large welfare states across the advanced world, far larger than anyone could have imagined, I think, uh, uh, 80 years ago, right? We, uh, uh, we have a number of countries that, where government spending is about half of national income. Um, and, um, uh, but also we have um, wide variation. So the welfare state in France or in Denmark is something like twice the size of the welfare state in the United States. Are France and Denmark societies with markedly less personal freedom than we have here. I don't think there's any reason to believe that any of that is true. And so the question I would say is, is there any reason to believe, aside from, I mean, if you're a libertarian, for, then, then you think that you have, a, 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 you have values, but is there any reason to believe that if you don't hold a libertarian view, but you do value personal freedom, that concern about those personal freedoms is a binding constraint on your notions of social democracy? Is there a reason to believe that the, the size, that the strength of the social safety net, the amount of regulation of business are limited, be, should be limited, have to be limited because you're concerned about personal liberty? And I would say no, there's, there's no evidence at all of that. There are constraints. There are constraints on, you know, there are political constraints. It turns out, you know, that not, not everybody wants uh, uh, a, a really expansive welfare state. And there are even, even liberals, uh, even liberal economists, uh, believe that there are economic constraints. If you argued for a welfare state that is much bigger than they have in France or Denmark, even I might worry about the sustainability in economic terms. But the idea that freedom is a real constraint on uh, the other definition of liberalism, is a real constraint on social democracy, just isn't borne out by anything that's happened in the world these past 75 years. Oh, Richard. Yes. Um, what I'm going to do is avoid a direct response to the two presentations. I think most of you are not sufficiently familiar with classical liberalism and what it holds and doesn't hold, that I thought what I would do is to try to give some explanation of what it is. And the first point I think that one has to do is to remember a famous remark of Jacob Viner back in 1960 when he wrote about the intellectual history of laissez-faire and said, when you're talking about laissez-faire, you should understand it in the way in which it's viewed by its supporters rather than in the way in which it's viewed by its critics. Now, the reason why this turns out to be as important as one might expect is that it turns out the classical liberal position is not anarcho-libertarianism. Uh, what it does do is to try to recognize all sorts of areas in which government regulation is appropriate and then to try to uh, identify some areas where it turns out that it does not work uh, particularly well. And so when you start to figure out exactly what do you need for government, uh, there is, of course, this constant pressure in order to deal with public goods. 
which could be loosely defined as those goods which have given to one have to be given to all, for which some system of taxation, preferably flat in my view, ought to be used to fund these kinds of things. And that gets you into a fairly large government, having to deal with defense, putting together a court system, and so forth. Uh, there are many kinds of industries that are not amenable to competitive solutions. Network industries are one form of that, and you have to figure out what form of regulation is going to be appropriate. There is a long and complex history of common carriers where you have only a single supplier in an industry, but it's infeasible to break it up because of the loss of efficiencies. And the whole system of rate regulation essentially is one uh, that occupied the United States Supreme Court very tensely and tightly in the period between 1870 and 1940. Uh, there are also serious problems about externalities associated with environmental harm, uh, including pollution of one form or another. Uh, there is the destruction of common pool resources, which requires some degree of control. There are situations associated with the bankruptcy of certain businesses for which it turns out that either you have some kind of collective solution or that the ongoing concern value of many corporations will, in fact, be lost. Uh, so one is not arguing here for a world in which there is no form of regulation. Uh, the proposition that I'm going to defend on this particular case is one that doesn't address now, at least, the question of redistribution through Medicare and similar situations. It is what I think to be the great mistake of the New Deal in many, many areas, which was to substitute systems of industrial cartels um, for competitive markets in a wide range of issues. The first point that I would want to make is that cartels are always more inefficient than monopolies, which I'm not defending, because they have distributional constraints amongst their members, which lead to inefficient forms of outcome. And what happened is the New Deal was the master cartel maker, and Roosevelt supported them very vigorously. And you start looking at the kinds of programs that had this. Uh, they include the Agricultural Adjustment Acts, which cartelized farm prices and so forth, National Labor Relations Act, which had monopoly unionization, uh, the Motor Vehicle Act, which limited what you could put on the highways one way or another, the Civil Aeronautics Board, which set rates in what would have otherwise been one form of competitive industry. And all of these things, it seems to me, are mistakes because what they do do is they knock down the efficiency of a competitive market in areas where they work. Do these things have bad consequences? The answer is yes. If you check, for example, the relationship between caloric intake in the cities and the cartelization protection of farmers, you see that there was, in fact, systematic malnutrition that resulted from these things. So the question then is, how do you want to think about this? And I think, in effect, what you first want to do in a society is look at areas where regulation is improvident. You can reduce administrative cost and increase output by doing these things in. And let me end with a Hayekian story, uh, which I think helps put this thing into perspective. In 1943, uh, Felix Frankfurter, a Harvard professor, um, is faced with the question of how it is that you allocate the frequencies which is a newfound resource uh, which depended upon the utilization of the electromagnetic spectrum. And what happened is uh, the earlier approach says what the government ought to do is to create a system of property rights whereby you have boundaries and then in effect have private owners and allow them to devote them to whatever purposes uh, they want. And our friend ha um, Frankfurt has said no, and when we talk about the public interest, convenience, and necessity, we not only talk about the rules of the road, but the composition of the traffic. And for the next 50 years, nobody knew exactly what that composition was with respect to broadcast licenses. It turned out Hayek, on this point, was, I think, quite sound. And when he talked about the same thing with respect to the highways, he said, what we do is we set the rules of the road and don't determine the composition of the traffic. And so the question I'm leaving to you, at least in this one corner, of classical liberalism is you think that the direct administrative state in allocating frequencies or anything else, agricultural prices and so forth, could outperform competitive markets. If I'm right in what I say, and you could expand the pie, what it does is it eases the pressure on the welfare system. More people will be prosperous, fewer people will be needing demands. It will, in effect, improve life expectancy up and down the system. And the point that I think is dramatic is this wonderful book by Robert Gordon, who's trying to explain the rise and fall of American growth. And it turns out the period of unparalleled prosperity was 1870 to 1940, which was the period of laissez-faire liberalism on the Supreme Court 
pretty much in the definition that I'm talking about. And I don't think any social improvements that we've had in the last 20 years have equaled that. So even if one is going to say, and I agree with Paul on this, that you cannot say about Medicare uh, that what you're really worried about is the freedom issue above all, if you're worried about the productivity system, there's so many mistakes in how it's organized that it turns out it's a serious drain on the economy. And so that's where I'll leave it for the moment. Thank you very much, uh, all three of you. Um, I'd like to give each of you a chance uh, to just spend a few minutes reflecting on the remarks of the other panelists. Um, and just to mix up the order, why don't we start with Paul? All right. Um, let me um, just start with with a thought. I mean, Heather talked about inequality, and uh, and um, among other things, the impact of inequality on the political system. And I, I think one thing we we really do want to ask is both in terms of politics and actually in terms of people's lives, whether a laissez-faire system. Um, is actually uh, all that good for personal freedom. Um, it's, certainly, um, it's certainly in practice, uh, it, you know, the days of, of, of um, relatively classical liberal government uh, were, were also days when democracy was fairly often uh, uh, kind of a, almost a fiction, uh, when, when, uh, when uh, uh, malefactors of great wealth basically were, uh, bought a lot of political influence and were, in some important ways we've gone back to those days. Um, and even, I, I, I just think if, if you ask, in a system where there are no um, countervailing institutions, just the market, um, how free do individuals feel? Um, I, I don't think that, I think that uh, the, the reality um, under such circumstances is that uh, individuals often feel very unfree, not only because they, uh, if something bad happens, they, they, are, they can fall into the, into the economic abyss, uh, but because they often feel at the mercy of their employers. Um, even, even um, you should say, well, in a competitive labor market, they should always be able to find another job. You know, if, think, think of, a, I, I probably should have better answers here, but think of a Victorian servant. Uh, um, worry when they were a large part of the labor force in Victorian uh, times. Uh, think of a Victorian servant uh, worried about uh, incurring the displeasure of her, or usually her employer. Uh, did she feel, well, it's a market economy, I can go elsewhere? No, she felt if I, if I get in trouble, I can't get references and I will actually uh, end up uh, on the streets of London. Um, that's telling us that in, in many ways a, a strong safety net and organized institutions uh, that, that create uh, countervailing power to the market in itself, in, in important ways can enhance personal liberty. They can go too far. No one, you know, no one wants us to be Venezuela. In fact, some of us are old enough to remember when unions were really powerful and sometimes they became a, a, a source of unfreedom, but it's not at all the case that, that a market economy is a really free one. Um, Richard, I. I mean, I don't quite know where, if, if we're saying let, let's, let's evaluate regulations based on whether they're actually good uh, and find a role for the market where we think it can actually, which, you know, it's, uh, where it can deliver, um, that's kind of the difference between social democracy and socialism. I mean, uh, if you're a social democrat, you're, you believe in a market economy except and, uh, the, the, and the line is, is based upon practicalities. I, I don't know anyone uh, who would defend uh, the New Deal's cartel policy. Uh, even people who think that the New Deal, like me, who think that the New Deal was a fabulous thing, don't actually think that the cartelization was a particularly good idea. But, that's, uh, uh, but we do think that unemployment insurance and the Works Progress Administration, and so the, it's, it, of course, there can be things that are a mistake, but I, I, it, I don't know. That's a, and of course, it, you're, it's, it's an empirical question where, where the line uh, should be drawn, not, not a deep philosophical one. Let me just say before turning to colleagues in about two or three minutes, um, cards will be distributed. There'll be an opportunity to um, set down some questions which will then get collected in about 15 or 20 minutes from now. We'll, we'll, we'll turn to those questions. Um, I'm going to let you go last and then Richard next. So Who goes now? Me? Yep. 
Okay, yes, I'm, uh, let me just sort of make some comments about both presentations. One on the question about the question about inequality and how one starts to deal with it. I regard this as a very, very vexing question for the following very simple reason. Uh, the most easy way to create greater, in, greater equality is to lower total output. Um, it's easier to level down than it is to level up. It's much harder to level up than it is to level down. And so the great challenge that's associated with the sort of egalitarian vision is how it is that it can unleash these competitive forces. And one of the reasons why that turns out to be extremely difficult is there's this great opinion that I urge you all to read uh, called Coppage in Kansas by Justice Pitney, who said, any system in which you have labor freedom is going to result in inequalities of wealth. And I think that tension is something which we too easily put under the ground. The classical liberal solution to that question was quite different from the one that we have today. It was an elaborate theory associated with what we call imperfect obligations, is what you did is you got a Mr. Stanford, Mr. Hopkins, Mr. Sloan, Mr. Kettering, all these people to put together one kind or another of institutions uh, that were designed to handle things at the bottom. And there's been some pretty good work that says if you basically put in mandatory protections, you destroy the voluntary protections another difficulty. So you have to be careful about the equality stuff, how far you go and how it works. With the request to Paul, uh, there are two kinds of libertarians in this world. Uh, there are some of them who think of themselves as deontological, freedom is a necessary good and so forth, and put themselves in an anti-welfarist position. I am not that kind of a libertarian. My view about what libertarian it is, is, as technically speaking, is that the first positions in libertarian, uh, which is the protection of personal autonomy against the use of force, and the creation of contractual freedom, and individual autonomy and personal relations and so forth, is a vast improvement over a state of nature in which everybody can kill everybody else. Uh, but the question then is, can you find other kinds of Pareto improvements which will improve that particular situation? And the answer is that you surely can. And when you start looking at them, they are going to require new institutions. So when I'm talking about a market economy and competitive stuff, I'm not saying, oh, we don't want to have an interstate commerce commission, which came around in 1887, or that state public utility commissions trying to regulate various sorts of rates were inappropriate. In fact, uh, there was a very much more complicated disciplined system of state controls that existed. And the empirical proposition that I'm making is that the rates of growth that we had in this material indicate that by Paul's criteria, uh, it turns out these systems tended to do relatively well. The best measure we have is life expectancy, because there's no way that could be concentrated in the top 1%. And essentially, which a figure which was relatively stagnant in 1900, life expectancy in the United States for whites was about 47, for blacks was about 32. That gap has almost completely vanished today. It's down to three or four years. And until very recent years, uh, the numbers increased inordinately. So that from 1900 to 1920, it goes from 47 to 54, then it goes to 61, then to 66. You can't get that kind of growth out of any other institutions except for those that increase the pie. And if you measure equality, not by dollars, but by longevity and life, quality of life, it turns out classical liberalism does better than many people have suspected. And Heather. Yeah, so um, I think the last time I was in this room, I heard Angus Deaton talking about issues around life expectancy. And um, of course, he and um, uh, Anne Case have done work showing that in recent years, um, there's been a decline in life expectancy for some parts of the US population. So I think that's an, it's a really interesting metric, and it's an important point that you bring up. But we also have to put it within the context of today. So, and I appreciate the historical um, perspective you've brought to the, to the conversation, Richard. But let me bring it up to um, some of the economic and social trends that we're thinking now, that we're seeing now, that I think um, should bear on how we think about this question. So when we talk about economic growth, fundamentally and most importantly, I think we have to, especially in a democracy, we have to ask the question, growth for whom? And one of the things, one of the most important trends we've seen is that in recent decades, that growth has gone almost exclusively to the very top. So let me just give you a couple of statistics, a couple of charts that I usually have in my bag, which I wasn't allowed to bring tonight, so let me just draw you a picture. Um, when you look at economic growth between 1963 and 79, two-thirds of Americans experienced growth that was at the average, 
the average income growth in the country was 1.7%, and about two-thirds of people experienced 1.7% growth. If you were rich, you actually experienced growth that was less than 1.7%, and if you were poor, you experienced higher growth, about 3%. So it was progressive, and most people grew when the economy grew. So I think many of the arguments that Richard makes make a lot of sense that you should focus on growth when everybody's gaining. Since 1980, which I think is a, you know, uh, Paul's already mentioned the world, words Ronald Reagan, you know, he was elected in 1980. Since then, the trends have changed dramatically. First of all, growth is slowed. So instead of being 1.7, it's like 1.4, 1.5% over that time period. And the vast majority of people, 90%, have seen growth that has been less than the average. And if you go down the income distribution, those people are seeing growth that is, that is even larger, less than the average. The only people that have, that have grown alongside the American economy have been those in the top 10%, and disproportionately those in the top 0.1%. So I actually think that the burden of proof over my lifetime, and definitely in the 21st century, is on whether or not laissez-faire economics has anything to offer the majority, right? And I think if we're, you know, the, the, the topic of this convening is liberalism and the intersections between, the and for this panel, the economy and um, our democracy, at least how, that's how I think about liberalism. I'm an economist, so maybe that's not as deep as the earlier conversations today. But how well the economy is performing for the majority has to be an important measure on this question of state and market. So I, would, I just want to point out a couple of other things. One is that one of the themes that we've talked up that folks have mentioned is this word balance, which Ira, you talked about in your remarks as well. Um, one little statistic that is kind of fun to throw around um, in a kind of grim sort of way, I think, is that um, when you think of the share of people in, who are uh, in the private sector who are in unions today, that share is now lower than it was before we made unions legal in the 1930s. So, which I think it's a dramatic statement of just how far this balance of power has shifted. And so, if, so we are left in this situation where we've destroyed many of the institutions that create that countervailing power. And what we've seen, just on the facts, is that some people are reaping all of the gains of this enormous thing, this amazing thing that we call the US economy and we call capitalism. And it's, not, it's no longer being shared, which I think poses fundamental, and again, I live and work in Washington, DC. These seem to, to me to be posing very fundamental questions for our democracy and for the viability of this system moving forward. Um, the last thing I wanted to say is I was really excited to hear you talk about um, network industries as places where we need more regulation. One of the things that we've been thinking. Uh, because they don't have competitive solutions. They don't have, well, okay, they don't have competitive solutions. Um, but I think that is a very interesting, and I'll, this will be my last point, but um, you know, one of the most remarkable changes that we're seeing in our economy is, of course, the advance of technologies, where now we are seeing a very small group of people uh, most of whom are uh, uh, white and male, it seems like, if uh, 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 given, given our experience of them, um, are reaping the gains of so much of this technological change um, and the new sort of platform firms and that aspect of our economy that, that our government seems, um, at this point at least, ill-equipped to know how to unpack. And I think that's one place where this question of state and market is really going to become ever more pressing in the years to come. So if I may, stimulated by each of your remarks, if I could I'll give you an opportunity to respond to each other, but I'd like to put three questions on the table, each one stimulated by something each of you has said, and then you take it from, from there as you wish. Um, to Heather, um, how would you like to, us to find a balance between the problem or problems of inequality and problems of poverty? Um, and as a policymaker, would you want to address first the threshold question of what are the cap resources and human capabilities, whether in SENS or other terms, that would um, bring people up to effective citizenship in a free liberal democracy, um, as opposed to the distribution um, question of uh, up and down the ladder? How, how would you like us to think about uh, uh, 
inequality and breakpoints, especially one below which um, citizenship cannot operate effectively. To Paul, um, my question would be, at what point um, would the Polanyian puzzle about when welfare states um, emerge that potentially could emerge that inter interrupt market processes even without destroying a market economy so as to reduce their capabilities, their competitive and other capabilities, without delivering sufficient um, gains that would enable average people um, to live uh, more decent and better lives. And the, the worry Polanyi had, I'm asking these always about liberal democracy, um, was that it's possible to have a circumstance in which um, uh, social policy creates a circumstance that leads to less rather than more legitimacy for liberal democracy among people who were themselves meant to be the beneficiaries of the social policy. How would we know when we're in that wrong moment as opposed to good um, welfare states? And Richard, a historical question really about your arc of 1870 to 1940 as the laissez-faire moment. Of course, you did not mention 1929 to 33. Um, and I, oh, hold it, I know in aggregate it works, um, but the reason I ask that is that the, in the moment of, in that long moment, whether you take 1873, 1893, 1929, the peaks and the troughs not only were, were amazing, but grew so substantial that they brought into question the very legitimacy of liberal democracy. So much so that in this very period, um, around the globe, uh, democracy after democracy toppled. Um, and from that perspective, the New Deal experiments, um, some in retrospect successful, others less successful, um, had the great merit of showing that a liberal democracy could address the largest problems of the day um, without um, canceling the basic features of liberal democratic life. Um, and that, one could argue, uh, was the great achievement, even if you might retrospectively, um, both of you, Paul as well as you, retrospectively judge some of those policies to have been less than optimal. But in aggregate, they did two things. They evened out the, the peaks and the troughs, potentially, and second, um, built more legitimacy for liberal democracy. So in effect, my question to each of the three of you is to reflect on the relationships between the positions you took and the viability, the capacity, and decent future of liberal democracy. Which order do you want us to go? Um, whoever wants to jump on first. <laughs> oh, I'm not shy. Um, let me first answer a couple of observations. Sorry. by Collectively, we have about six minutes before we go to the audience. Okay, well this will be relatively short. One of the things is the Reagan period did not reverse the size of government, it simply slowed the rate of growth. And so if you want to do a correlation, government size and slower growth uh, seem to positive negative. That is, you get less growth when you get more government and you, you can't just simply assume uh, that things have gone on that direction. Um, the second thing about the, the New Deal stuff, uh, Herbert Hoover, of course, um, did sign the Smoot-Hawley Act. Herbert Hoover did raise income taxes to 62.5%. Herbert Hoover did sign Norris LaGuardia. Uh, Herbert Dewitt did sign the Davis-Bacon Act, which simply did. So what happened, it was a very bad period. Now, I didn't say everything that Roosevelt did was bad. I thought the bank closing was the correct thing to do given the long and short nature of the market. And I didn't mention anything particularly hostile about the SEC, because I think, in effect, stabilization is appropriate. And so I concentrated on the things that I thought were bad. And if, in fact, you understand this, the whole point about this discussion is to say liberal democracy makes mistakes. And the way in which you try to correct the mistakes is to put in place those institutions which understand uh, what the limits and the uses of government power turn out to be. And certain other things like, you know, public works program and things of that sort, many of them, if you looked at the rate of return for them, were extremely high. But the general cartel policy probably prolonged the Depression by three or four years. And the irony is it was a greater disaster with the 
Federal Reserve in place and deflation in the 1930s than the earlier ones that you referred to. Thanks. Paul? Okay, by the way, just a word on life expectancy. Um, uh, life expectancy at birth is you know, very heavily about infant mortality, and in many ways, um, what matters for many of our policies is life expectancy later on. And, and the overwhelming fact for the United States is that life expectancy at age 65, um, which used to be similar um, at different income levels, has radically diverged, that we've seen a, a continuing steady rise for the upper part of the income distribution and a flattening, or in some groups, a decline in the lower part of the income distribution. Um, and this has not happened in Europe, by the way. But if, if, you, if you study these issues about, you know, what should we do with Social Security and Medicare, um, you're constantly facing this, well, we, you know, life expectancy is greater, so we should raise the age of eligibility, which is basically saying um, janitors should not be able to retire because lawyers are living longer. Uh, it's uh, it's it, given given the realities of these U.S. It's just it's, it's a huge the, the you know, um, Now, let me just say on the on the, the, the question of so the, the underlying this is the idea that um, uh, there's a harsh trade-off between um, equality and efficiency. That if you want to do more redistribution, you're going to pay a price for it in, in terms of the, the performance of the economy. And you know, I'm a card-carrying economist, which means that at sufficiently high levels of taxation and so on, that must exist. But there is a lot of evidence that certainly where the U.S. is now, there is no such trade-off, or if anything, it runs the other way. So what we see is very little evidence that there are significant disincentive effects from taxation of high incomes, but we see very strong evidence that things like availability of Medicaid when you were a child, availability of food stamps when you were a child makes you a more productive adult. Um, and uh, I have to say, this is a, if, if I had been sitting in 1950 and you had told me how big government would be in most of the advanced world, uh, I think even given my political values, I might have thought that it would, but, and, and of course, some people see what they want to see. They, uh, I've, it, it was, there was a little flurry during the summer with Fox News suddenly deciding that Denmark was a socialist hellhole. Uh, but if, you know, I defy you to walk around Denmark and, and, and keep with that conclusion. So there you have a, a government that spends basically half of GDP, very generous social programs, and the thing is, you know, people still work, it still functions. So I think that this, we shouldn't just invoke the um, negative economic impacts of, redistri of redistribution, of trying to have a more equitable society. Um, independent, again, we've, we've run this experiment and we've actually seen that the negative effects of redistribution are much smaller than people used to believe and we found a lot of positive effects. I will note that um, I run a center that uh, funds scholars and a, and a lot of research on this very question and we have so many papers and so much evidence on this. Um, so if you wanna know more, um, check, I'm, I'm happy to both tell you more about it but to check out our website. Um, um, let me go straight to your question, Ira, which I think is just so important about inequality and the problem of poverty and when the balance and should we focus on effective citizenship as opposed to distribution. So a couple of answers. Um, first, I think that given where we are now in American politics, speaking only about what's happening here, one of the, the, one of the things that really looms large in my mind is a failure is the failure of those of us who have been making policy and thinking about what policies we should prioritize and how we should implement them if we want to create a more equitable society, not 100% equality, but a more equitable, create more opportunity, is that we haven't spent enough time thinking about what the follow-on effects are gonna be of any policy. And we haven't spent enough time thinking about whether or not a particular policy is gonna build power or whether it's gonna stunt power or whether it's gonna have nothing to do with that. And I think in the area of um, thinking about poverty, right, we're never, in the United States, it, it seems highly unlikely that we're, we're, we're never gonna solve all the problems of poverty by just giving somebody a check or even services, right? What people need are access to good jobs, they need access to healthcare and childcare and, and retirement and all of these things, but they fundamentally need access to an economy that delivers for them. They need access to good jobs during their working years. And what we haven't 
focused on is making sure that A, we have enough of that, what, what some people um, call pre-distribution, those access to good jobs, but that that also then, um, uh, that you're also thinking about policies that are gonna power build so that you can create the kind of politics so that you can take that to the next level. Um, one of the, um, and so, as I have been thinking about the challenge, and as I'm thinking about how does it we actually create policies that focus on the poor and that bring people up and, and focus on citizenship, this brings to the, to the fore the question, should I focus on giving money to the poor? Right, is this the way that I'm gonna solve this problem? Or is the problem so structural that I need to figure out what these other economic problems are and why it is that all of the gains of growth are going to the top? Have we been looking in the wrong place? Is, is, I think, is the question that I have been thinking about for really the past four or five years. And the answer that I keep coming back to is that if we actually wanna solve this problem, if we actually want an economy that delivers for more for the majority, we actually need to spend a lot more time thinking about where the power lies, both economic and then feeding into political power. And that means we're gonna to have to spend more time thinking about what's happening at the top, who is taking all those gains from growth, what are they doing them, why aren't they investing them as much as they should, why aren't we seeing sky high great rates of growth and productivity if we've got all of this money sloshing around because by some arguments we should. Um, and so I think actually the solutions come from thinking about what's happening at the top and then creating a politics that is more responsive to the majority over time that then we can start addressing these, these challenges at the bottom. Thanks. So we have a series of questions from the audience. Um, the first two um, I would pose to all the panelists and then there are, we'll have time I hope for three more which are posed to individuals on the panel. Um, the first one posed to all the panelists reads as follows. Inequality always seems to be correlated with race in America. Will policies that do not target histor those historical inequities ever make a dent in American inequality? Should we be focusing on the population as a whole or focus on specific groups first? Which of you would you like, Richard? Um, this is a very complicated question like everything else, but let me just give a couple of numbers. In 1948, the unemployment rates of blacks and whites were roughly the same in the height of segregation, but there was no minimum wage law, and that bound. And then as that number started to move up, the divergence started to took place. And so the thing that I'm always most worried about under all of these circumstances is rules that protect some who get over the bar, keep others from getting over that particular bar. And if you look at the numbers, which Heckman and others have put together in the 90s, what you discover is when you have an anti-discrimination law and so forth, it turns out that the dispersion within the minority population start to increase, some doing very well, and others starting to do more. My own view about all of this is the first thing you try is market liberalization to get more people in, and the second thing that you try is to support those schools, the voucher schools, the success academy, and so forth, which in fact seem to have tremendous ability in increasing the human capital of Dominican and African American students. Uh, but I don't think in effect that transfer payments are going to do this, and I don't think you're gonna be able to get these strong programs unless in the public sector you could weaken the force of the unions that are blocking their formation and success. Okay. Um there was a, I mean, uh, raw discrimination was a big factor in racial inequality, and, and it's, of course, still exists to an important extent. Uh, but you also had, you know, something happened uh, to, uh, to a lot of the African-American community um, in, in the 60s and onwards. Um, and, but now I think, uh, I, I think that in trying to understand that, you want to look at recent stuff, you want to look at Case and Deaton. Um, and what I, one, one of the things to read in, from Case and Deaton is that William Julius Wilson was right. When the, when the jobs disappear, when urban jobs for, for blacks went away, that's when the social indicators started to, um, to fall apart. And sure enough, when it, that same thing happens to white people in the American heartland, they start to have a, a similar collapse in the social indicators. So if you want to deal, I mean, clearly we need to fight race, you know, act, actual racial discrimination, but if you really want to help people um, 
it's Heather's agenda. You need, it's, it's not just transfer payments, but it's trying to create an economy that provides people with meaningful work, which is much harder. But you know, there's a reason we're now talking about regional policies, uh, but that should, we should have been doing that all along for inner city employment as well. Yeah, I will, I'll add to that a couple of um, areas that we need to focus. Uh, so the question, you know, can we do this through the way I'm interpreting the question through universal policies or do you have to focus on specific groups is of course a, a profoundly important one and I think the answer is yes, yes we need to do both. Um, it's not an either or, it's definitely a yes and. Um, you need to focus on policies around full employment but you need to make sure that everybody has access to those and you also then need to deal with specific issues at this point um, because of the high incarceration rates in the African American community especially among men, you have to deal with both um, taking steps to lower that in the first place and then making it possible for people to reintegrate back into our democracy as well, back, as, well as back into the labor market. Um, the inability of people with a criminal record to be able to get back into jobs or to vote um, is really limiting that ability to um, uh, close some of those racial gaps in, in important ways and that must be uh, one of our targets. At the same time, um, you know, Paul brought up um, issues around life expectancy and infant mortality, and one of the things that we know from the research now is that um, things that happen to us even when we're in the womb have lifelong uh, effects on our employment and earnings. And that includes things like living in a neighborhood with a high level of pollution or having parents that aren't getting appropriate health care, you know, before you're, when you're in the womb or um, before the, the child is even conceived. And these are inequalities that have huge racial um, disparate effects at this point. And so one of the most important things that we could do to be closing some of these gaps is actually to focus on young people and young families in ways that we don't now. And you can look at the lack of expansion, for example, of Medicaid in uh, many states around the country as exacerbating those gaps, something that if we were to do, would be both universal and targeted. The next question, which of course you'll see has no resonance in today's newspapers, is um, how important has the Supreme Court been in, eff in affecting the balance between big government and free markets and what impact do you expect the Trump Supreme Court to have um, on these matters? I think you're looking at me somehow. Well, I'll take it. I mean, <laughs> look, the Supreme Court is a very complicated institution. The public perceptions are surrounding essentially four issues, gun control, campaign finance, affirmative action, and abortion. Uh, but most of the business is somewhere else, in areas that I specialize in, like property and so forth, and administrative law. Uh, the great tragedy of the Supreme Court is the indefinite rules it has on confiscation and regulation, and the very fluid administrative processes create a dynamic in which rent-seeking actually has higher rates of return, which produce lower levels of income. Uh, in terms of how much this affects the economy writ large, um, I would say it is much smaller than any changes that you're going to have from the political branches and the way in which these things start to operate. Um, certainly the Obama and the Trump policies had much more dramatic short-term effects. Uh, the Supreme Court is important, but I have to say, uh, as somebody who spends his time studying too much, I suspect, their cases, I think in terms of the macro trends that you're trying to talk about here, this is not the dominant institution to which you look. Uh, so I am not a legal expert, caveat. However, um, my, my understanding um, is that the economic regulatory issues that this court, especially if Kavanaugh is seated, um, actually could be quite important for our economy moving forward. Again, I'm not the expert, but that is, that is my understanding that yeah, I've been... But, but, but negatively is the problem. But what? Is that the current Supreme Court's views on these issues is generally negative in terms of its growth impact, with the uncertainty in the ways in which the system is put well, together. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, it, it, I think if you look at the history, um, it, although the Supreme Court, uh, the nine old men, did try to stop the, the New Deal, in the end they did not. Um, so in fact, in, in history as it actually played out, the Supreme Court did not play a big role one way or the other. Both, both the rise and then the, the um, backlash against uh, the, uh, the expanded welfare state in the United States um, were pretty much driven by forces that had nothing to do with it. Looking forward, um, who knows? I mean, it, it's certainly true that, that uh, 
You know, if, if we had, if we were capable of focusing on such things, uh, Kavanaugh is a radically anti-worker, ra radically anti-organized labor anyway, but also workers' rights um, uh, justice, and that could make it, but uh, on the other hand, maybe if, if we, if we end up in a situation where we have a, the voters have, have overwhelmingly basically declared they want to defend um, social democracy in America and we have a court that, that nonetheless tries to strike it down, uh, we may have another confrontation which would probably end the same way the confrontation in the 30s did with no outright break, but in fact with the, the, the will of the people prevailing. Just one kind of, the change in American labor law doctrinally in the last 60 years has been negligible. Uh, most of the changes have come because the industry people and resisting unions have figured out how to put their campaign together in ways that actually persuades workers. And what they do is they point out that General Motors, as a unionized firm, had 500,000 workers in 1979, and by 2008, in dint of hard labor, they reduced themselves to 40,000. A footnote from me, I think the single most important moment in the history of trade unions came when Southern Democrats joined Republicans to override President Truman's veto of Taft-Hartley, which made it impossible for the unions to expand beyond their base, and therefore, the American unions never became a national political class. Disagree I know you entirely. disagree with what I've just Violently. said. Violently. Let, let's not go there. I, 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 but I, I couldn't forbear. Yeah, you couldn't resist. Um, uh, we have, um, uh, have three questions. You each get one minute to an okay. one point two minutes to answer them. Yes. Or no. um, yes. That's that's too, that's too short an answer. Okay. Um, for Professor Epstein, and it's not necessarily the order. Just think about the question. I'm going to read all three. Um, you see, for Professor Epstein, you seem to suggest that philanthropy by the wealthy is better than government in providing social welfare to deal with inequality. Does that not subvert democracy at a basic level? To Professor Krugman, um, what, are there any economies that have outperformed the United States because they lean more in the direction of laissez-faire than ours? And dear Estonia. former student of mine, Boucher, um, um, what, what issues in economic or regulatory policy are important but getting little attention from the media or elsewhere, and are any of those policies that would be especially good for women and families? And um, let's, you, literally, we have 1.2 minutes each or something for these complicated questions, but no, we'll I go. Should start. I think the question on philanthropy to some extent has it sort of backwards. Uh, the basic position about philanthropy that I think worked quite well is you subsidize it through charitable deductions, but you get private people to watch and to monitor it. And what happens is you get not a thousand points of life, but you get many different private charities targeting different activities and different kinds of groups. And what happens is the next person who comes in sees what the lay of the land is and tries to move where it's maximum impact. You get much more per dollar because it's higher level of monitoring. When you start to run these programs through the government, the political side of this becomes much more powerful, and it's always going to be a great question as to where you do it. So, for example, when you're talking about the distribution of Obamacare waivers, a kind of a benefit-type situation, uh, do you want to give them to red states, to blue states, to union guys, not guys? And generally speaking, what the government does, it has too much discretion in the way in which it waives requirements so as to allow voluntary activities to go forward, and too much discretion imposing obstacles on the ways in which these things start to happen. It's quite clear that you're not going to do without the currents, you know, without a sort of a transfer economy one way or another. And so I'm just making a modest claim at this point uh, that at the margin you would rather have more decentralization rather than less so that something like the Obama proposal to say that we're going to limit the charitable deduction to 28% even if it turns out you're in the 35 or 40% tax rate, what it does is it hurts the recipients as much as the donors. So my initial answer, no, was right. Um, the, um, I mean, there are, there are no advanced countries that are more or less safer than the U.S. <laughs> so right there, you, you've just, uh, there's no one else who's, you know, uh, in, in our current state place in the league tables that's more or less safer. You do, you know, I've been through this now, repeated, watched over the years. Um, you find some market-based alternative to uh, 
to a, a social program which gets touted as being a great thing. So I, I'm, I'm old enough to remember when everyone was talking about the Chilean retirement system as being a great thing. It turned out that the Chileans themselves hated it and, and eventually ended up moving to something much more like our system. Um, more recently, people talk about Singapore. And um, you know, for, first of all, Singapore isn't actually laissez-faire at all. Um, and second, you know, their healthcare system is not what people think it is. So, so the answer is no. There, there, there are no you know, freer markets than us success stories out there. So um, my initial answer was yes, and that definitely is also the answer to my question. Um, so there are uh, uh, sets of policies that are making um, enormous progress, I think, um, in the area of uh, how to address challenges between work and life, so that intersection between state and market, but how that plays out uh, for individual families. Um, it'll soon be the case that a quarter of American workers um, will be covered by a statewide or district-wide, because the District of Columbia is included in this, um, program that provides paid family and medical leave to all workers as a matter of being a citizen of that state, um, which is an enormous achievement. It's only happened over the past 15 years, and brand new social insurance programs fully paid for by payroll taxes. And I'm pretty, I'm gonna go out on a limb and I'm gonna guess that probably nobody here in this audience is, many of you may not even know about them, but there's been no major stories about how these programs have been, um, uh, they've not been underfunded, they've not been, um, uh, had any stories about fraud or abuse that have really said that they've been not well run, but these are new programs that are providing this really important benefit, giving people six to eight weeks of paid family leave when they have a new child, when they have to care for a sick family member, and changing people's lives in a really real and palpable way, and addressing middle class anxiety, and keeping people out of poverty. Um, many of us have spent much of the day in a conference on um, thinking about um, core issues about liberalism and democracy. And I think we all could agree that um, a key feature of a robust, uh, uh, decent political life are efforts at democratic reason in which a variety of positions about fundamental issues get articulated. We've just had that experience and uh, such an experience and I hope you'll join me in thanking the three panelists. Thank you.